now I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Chris Tucker, um, who is the chairman of the American Geographical Society. Um, Chris, thank you so much for being with us. Welcome um, and over to you. Thanks for having me. I'll share my screen real fast. Oops. I think I failed to share. Give me a second. All right, I think I'm up. Um, so thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's very important questions. What is sustainable population? Why, when, and what should we do about it? Uh, thanks to Scientists Warning Europe for holding this event, uh, Ed Gemmel and your team for organizing, Phoebe Barnard for getting me uh, invited, and uh, the opportunity to share a stage with Professor Reese and uh, Dr. O'Sullivan is a real honor. Thank you very much. Thanks for all of you to take, uh, for taking time today out of your Sunday uh, to uh, grapple with this important set of issues. So I'd like to start with uh, Earth Day 1970. Um, you know, Earth Day 1970, 51 years ago, uh, population was top of mind. Partially it was top of mind because uh, people recognized that from the 1.6 billion humans on the Earth around 1900, um, they had already faced the doubling and they recognized the slope of the curve. So it was, you know, again, front of mind uh, and uh, centered uh, in the Earth Day discussions. 50 years later, just last year, not a peep. Uh, you barely heard anything in the press. I searched. Uh, it just was not uh, central to the discussions of Earth Day at all, even though we had hit 7.7, .7, possibly even 7.8 by that time. The one notable exception uh, months earlier was the World Scientist Warning of Climate Emergency uh, by uh, <laughs> the Scientist Warning Organization in Bioscience. And uh, that's what really kind of caught my eye um, uh, honestly, uh, in the earlier incarnation of Science This Morning, I had missed those. It was not my field of study. It was not my area of interest at the time. Um, but to see population brought front and center to the discussions of the climate, uh, I thought was um, a brave and powerful uh, thing to do. Um, but to reflect on my own personal kind of story here, you know, it was 50 years ago that we had Earth Day, 51, but it was 25 years ago, 26, when uh, uh, as a student, I attended the uh, inaugural lecture of Columbia University's Earth Institute. And Joel Cohen, as the inaugural lecturer, uh, spoke on his new book, How Many People Can the Earth Support? And since that time, quarter century ago, I, I always viewed that as the most important question that all of us should be asking ourselves when we get up in the morning, <laughs> when we're talking with our friends and family and our colleagues. Uh, however, his, he didn't really have an answer that kind of dialed in on uh, a specific number or giving me personally a way that um, I, you know, I could be comfortable grappling with it. And it, was, it took a long time and you know, bulk of my career, uh, which straight into the field of geography for me to come up with my own answer. Um, not to, uh, since I didn't bury the lead at all, um, my numbers of 3 billion, we'll get to that later. Um, but, you know, when you talk about what is the carrying capacity of the planet, I think it's important for us to understand what is the planet. And, you know, part of my dissatisfaction with kind of earlier discussions and debates around the carrying capacity of the planet was kind of a lack of geographic grounding. And as the chairman of the American Geographical Society, I would be remiss to not use some maps to kind of uh, uh, lay out my argument. So first I talk about uh, eco-regions. Uh, the world is broken up into a, a finite number of specific eco-regions, specific ecological places on our planet that each have distinct names. Um, and to give you a little video tour real fast, right? Um, you know, each one of these places is a unique set of flora and fauna, uh, unique uh, uh, terrain and climate, singular flows of water. And you can't think of these places as, you know, just general land. And if we, you know, uh, uh, inhabit a certain number of hectares, you know, it'll be okay. And if we inhabit another number, it won't be okay. It really is about how we inhabit and potentially delete and burden these uh, eco regions. But it's not just terrestrial eco regions. Turns out we also have sorry, we also have some uh, marine eco regions that have been delineated through the same biogeographical 
uh, uh, methodology. And, you know, as we all know, uh, our oceans are very important to uh, life on our planet. And it's the interaction of these marine and terrestrial uh, ecoregions that matter to us. So in my efforts, um, you know, having been active in the geography and geospatial uh, science and technology community for so long, I just wanted to understand how we have burdened these unique uh, ecological places on our planet. And if you take those numbers Professor Reese kind of put out and array them spatially with just a handful of layers, roads, major highways that bisect and transect our, uh, our ecological regions, um, you know, the intensively uh, uh, cultivated agricultural zones, which are those big black smudges, uh, the toxic sites, which are in purple, the uh, uh, yellow, uh, which uh, yellow and orange, which is uh, de uh, ocean dead zones uh, from uh, excess agricultural and urban effluent. And red are the areas where we have intensely pop populated areas, which, as we all know, we have a tendency to pave a lot of the places where we live. Um, and annihilating, deleting, or burdening the ecological regions that are uh, underfoot. And, you know, got to have a spinning globe. Um, and this is important because, you know, we also have managed to throw enormous uh, uh, patches of garbage into our oceans in the yellow. Um, and this is just a handful of layers when you look at what is the human footprint on our planet at this stage in the game. So, you know, a lot of us here, we're talking about climate change. Therefore, we're talking about our carbon footprint. And indeed, our carbon footprint matters. Um, I would argue that our carbon footprint is uh, twice as bad as you think, but only one tenth of the problem. And I think this is something that Professor Reese really talked about. I'm not going to go into each of these. I've got a whole book on it if you feel like reading it. Um, uh, we all have our lists and way of breaking down kind of the human footprint on our planet, but it is massive and continuously growing with the growing population. So to today's topic, how do you calculate your maximum carrying capacity? This is chapter eight in my, uh, in my book, if you uh, feel like uh, digging in on a whole lot of words. Um, but it's important to recognize that this isn't a new question, and many people have dealt with it in very interesting and useful ways. Um, uh, in many ways, I'd say that my own thinking on this is just friendly amendments uh, on the shoulders of giants, as we like to say. Um, but to start, right, uh, back in 1970, Barry Commoner, Paul Ehrlich, and John Holdren, if you remember, John Holdren was Barack Obama's science advisor, um, came up with the IPAT, uh, uh, population times affluence times technology is kind of our footprint. Um, and they really focused on uh, energy and what was possible with the energy resources we had. Um, and they came up with a number. Well, we can talk about that number later. We also have the planetary boundaries thesis. Johan uh, Rockström from the uh, uh, Stockholm Resilience Center and Will Steffen from uh, Australian National University. Uh, they came up with a set of boundaries that if we surpass those boundaries, we will undermine our planet's ability to support us as a species. Um, ecological footprint thesis, uh, uh, Professor Reese indeed uh, is the creator of the ecological footprint concept. And the work of uh, Mathis Wackernagel, one of his um, uh, students, has done an amazing job of accounting at a national level uh, which countries are ecological debtors and which ones are ecological creditors, mostly through the lens of carbon accounting, um, uh, which uh, I think as we've discussed, um, uh, carbon footprint is only one small piece of our larger footprint, so I would argue that in many cases our footprint is uh, even more dire than uh, what comes out in those calculations, but what I think is critical about it is it brought in that realm of geography where we can understand what parts of the planet are uh, being burdened more than others and which are contributing to the net burden of our planet uh, more than others. Um, uh, geographically explicit biocapacity thesis, you will you Google this, you'll find it nowhere on the web. I had to contort lots of words uh, to try to fairly represent the work of um, uh, uh, Professor Paul Sutton at University of Denver, who's a pop population geographer, a sustainability scientist, and an ecological economist. Um, but that work really used uh, the innovations of satellite remote sensing. You, we all know about Landsat satellites and the Sentinel satellites that the EU has put up and our ability to understand at a you know, square kilometer level where the human, uh, where humanity is exerting its footprint has really provided, uh, I, I think, some additional tools to that tool set for understanding ecological footprint 
uh, uh, that, that humanity has had. And then what I call my own uh, plan of three billion thesis, which uh, I'll, I'll skip over other than to say, um, uh, my number that I come to is built upon all these methodologies, and it is an optimistic number of three billion uh, that we can get to later, um, only because I'm a technological optimist. But key here um, is not just the number that our planet can support, it is the fertility rate that we should seek. If we have indeed already exceeded our planet's ecological carrying capacity, if indeed we have been accumulating ecological debt at a nightmarish pace, uh, uh, since we passed that threshold in the mid 20th century, um, and we could argue when we pass that threshold uh, it, later in the discussion, then what is the total fertility rate that we need to seek? Because we actually need to bring that curve down. It is not enough to achieve zero population growth. That would be a total fertility rate of uh, 2.1. I would argue that we long ago exceeded our planet's carrying capacity, and we need to actually bring that curve down uh, not only uh, uh, so that we can um, uh, live within our planet's carrying capacity, but so that we can rewild and invest back in nature um, to, to frankly uh, help recover uh, what is quickly becoming a more abundant uh, planet. So my uh, call is for uh, 1.5 TFR by 2030. And some people may say, Chris, that's ridiculous. How could we ever do it? But you've seen in Professor Reese's diagrams, uh, fertility has actually uh, uh, declined steadily over the 20th century. Uh, I would say not fast enough, but we are currently at 2.45. So if you think about it in many ways, that's kind of uh, two to three children uh, per woman. And all I'm recommending is one to two children per woman uh, on average. Um, but we're talking about shifting a norm. And this is something I wrote about in Journal of Population and Sustainability. Uh, thank you to Dave Samways for providing great editorial work on that. Um, but uh, how do you go about doing that? Uh, just to point out that I'm not solely focused on population. In my book, I have a whole chapter around a cookbook for global leaders and global citizens of all the many things uh, that we could and should do uh, to help uh, bring our population, our planet in line with each other. Um, but I do like to call out that um, uh, uh, women and girls play a unique uh, role in our ability to get to a better place as a species and a planet. It just so turns out that every geography where women are empowered, women are educated, women are integrated into the workforce, and where women have access to family planning technologies, you witness a, 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 a total fertility rate that is either break even, right, replacement value, or below replacement value. And what I would argue is that investment in women and girls, uh, well-being in their education, uh, in their empowerment, uh, in their skills for uh, uh, engaging in the workforce, um, and again, access to family planning technologies is key if we're going to bend the population curve. Um, one comment, uh, there was an article in Lancet by the uh, IMHE uh, group, research group from University of Washington last summer, and they, uh, their new modeling was that they believe population will peak at 9.7 billion in 2064, which horrifies me because I believe we exceeded our Earth's uh, carrying capacity at 3 billion some 75 years ago. Um, uh, however, if you uh, look, look at that article, one of the nice things about it is they, uh, the basis of that estimate was to say, um, that investment in women's education and access to family planning is ahead of schedule, if you will. Um, more of it is, has happened than in a lot of the demographic models that are out there. So they believe that we will bend that curve earlier than many of these other projections. To which, uh, you know, I had a question back to the research lead on that paper asking, how much more investment in women and girls around the world would be required to bend the curve early? 1.5 uh, TFR by 2030. To which the response was, that's not our research question, which I thought was not cool. Um, but anyways, um, uh, investment in women and girls is key uh, to getting there. And by doing, um, by doing that, I think we need to kind of stop focusing on discussions of population control and population policy and, you know, uh, potential coercive measures and think about uh, 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 ethical just and empowering strategies toward women and girls. I think we'll all be shocked and amazed um, by what good it will do for our planet. 
I too want to call out uh, girlplanet.earth, great work um, uh, uh, that Phoebe uh, has been involved in. Um, I've got to uh, witness great work by uh, an amazing team um, of women and some men. Uh, it turns out men have a role uh, just as important or more important than women. It turns out men are at least, if not more, than half of the problem. Um, we should all, men and women, be focused on uh, the well-being of women and girls, and we need to listen to their voices. So that's why I'm kind of inspired by this effort. Uh, there's many voices. Uh, I've already uh, I woke up to this and uh, read a, a number of the, the stories. Um, and it made me think about things in ways that I had not before. So that's me. Um, all of you have an opportunity to save our planet. If you're beyond childbearing years, uh, you may be a grandparent. Everybody needs to understand uh, that uh, our reproductive behavior um, is a, a, a choice. It is something that uh, we um, have the most control over of probably of anything in our lives. Um, and that you know, every additional child, uh, one child has more ecological impact, you know, than, you know, going vegan, which you should do also. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we need to appreciate that this is something that is in our uh, control if we think about it the right way. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, we'll certainly be coming back to some of the things you pointed out there. That was great.